probably guess. Uh, Doug and I have some history. I'm not going to make this into a, into a, into a roast. Uh, I think you're in for a really special treat. Uh, Doug is uh, is a is a Manitoba resource, uh, born, bred, raised, trained uh, uh, in Manitoba, and. Uh, if, uh, if Leonardo da Vinci had computers, I guess the concept of a Renaissance man in computing is, is Doug, you know, from hardware to cloud-based, he's, uh, he's uh, seen it all, done it all, been there for the, for the journey. Uh, and as you saw from the invite, has been a, a basically a career scientist, research scientist with IBM for, uh, for, for decades. Um, Besides all those things, I'll just add that uh, he's also the quintessential nice guy. He's a team player, hockey, computing, you name it. Gonna embarrass you, Doug. Uh, but basically he makes uh, our, our teamwork uh, possible. So when I approached Doug about uh, possibly doing some machine learning and if he could hook us up with somebody, he put both hands up and said, I'm all in. Tell me what to do. Whatever's needed, I'm there to help, and uh, and that's what he is. He's just a, a super nice guy, team player. But as you'll hear from his talk, uh, he has a huge depth of knowledge. So, uh, thanks, Doug, for everything you've done, and take it away. Before you start, Doug, I want to know if you've got a no trade clause with Bill. <laughs> no, no, I'm a free agent. <laughs> Pending free agent, unrestricted. I don't know. Just kidding. If um, you can afford him. <laughs> yes. I always take on way too much for my own good. So that all fits. So I don't know how much I'm going to buy of what Bill's selling there, but I will say it, I like to have fun. And, and I did want to start by saying um, that it's great working with everyone on Bill's team. When we started this work, Sheldon Durkatch and Chris Kirby pushing ahead on the machine learning fronts and, and Bill on all fronts, you know, especially the hardcore statistics and, and now Barrett and, and Siobhan blasting away on the machine learning experimentation. Um, and also the MCHP folks, to, you know, Charles and, and Rod McRae and, and Darren, uh, coordinating with them has been great, just great to work with. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, Super fun. I've really been enjoying it. And, and thank you for the opportunity, I think is probably probably what I'll say. Uh, so it, it's interesting doing this talk because primarily this is going to be a talk about um, computer systems aspect. I'm a systems guy more than more than any of the other things I might be. Um, um, and so it's the systems aspects uh, of, of facilitating medical research within a secure environment. Um, but at the same time, I kind of imagine, uh, you know, from having been in the, in the series as an attendee, there's actually a, a quite a wide range of backgrounds and interests here, everything from, uh, you know, epidemiology and biostatistics through data science and machine learning to even a few people either that are into the, the kind of hardcore technical aspects of computer systems. So I think what I'm going to do is, is do kind of like a couple of passes over things. I'll do one pass at kind of a higher, more <coughs> abstract level. And then I'll go through it again at a deeper, more concrete technical level. And uh, hopefully that way there, there'll be something for everyone. Uh, but, but I'll say, you know, please ask questions along the way. If, there, if there's an answer that's gonna be too long, then I'll defer it to later, but especially questions of uh, clarification. You know, if there's something that's clear to me because of my background and not to a lot of folks out there and the rest of the talk is <laughs> on it, well, that's not a good thing. So. Definitely jump in and also, you know, slow me down if I uh, uh, get out of control as far as speed goes. I get excited about, <laughs> about all the work I do, so I get carried away. Um, okay, pass one. One slide or less, what's this talk about? Maybe two or three slides. Uh, so we're going to talk about the work we did moving Bill's nuclear medicine deep learning workstation, uh, represented here by good old SpongeBob, um, inside uh, MCHP, which is represented here by this jail cell. Uh, no, no pejorative intended. I'm sure MCHP is a wonderful spot and no one feels like they're imprisoned and can't escape. Um, really, next time I do this talk, I'll, I'll have a bank vault there, which would be more apt because the reason we locked up poor old Bob in there is that inside he can get access to a veritable treasure trove of data, which is the little pots of gold in the jail cell with him. And uh, I'll come back in a sec to the occasional visitation thing. 
But first, just for a little more detail on the pot of gold there, and I'm guessing, you know, almost everyone attending a talk this morning, although I might do this talk for like the Manitoba Linux users group in a while or something like that. Um, the pot of gold is the population research data repository. It's just a tremendous asset. It's, you know, many splendored, covers a lot of aspects. It's high quality, it's comprehensive, de-identified, it's longitudinal, it's all integrated. This is a world-class thing. And so our goal from within Bill's group, if we can combine our clinical data, like, you know, VFA DEXA scan images with data from the repository of covariates, um, uh, outcomes, you know, for us, it was like, yeah, you know what, by golly, with deep learning, we can, we can recognize mild vertebral fractures, which has been a challenge for all but the, the most expert. Uh, that's wonderful. But, you know, if you combine that with outcomes, it's like, hey, guess what, this stuff really is predictive of, of a major osteoporotic fracture down the road. So, you know, what practitioners can take this result and do something with it right now that that matters. And, you know, that's a higher impact thing. And that's where we're going. So by combining these two kinds of data, we're hopeful of, of uh, really doing a, a, a kind of a, a real forward pushing medical research. And of course, there's a fly in the ointment, that being you want to touch this data, you better have a very compelling reason, and you're going to need a boatload of approvals, and you're only going to get to touch the bits of data you really can show you need, and you're only going to get to touch it for as long as you need to touch it. And so um, I mentioned that because that feeds into on the deep learning system, how we organize data and how we organize the access control is to be respectful of those requirements. Um, I don't think it's pushing the metaphor too far to talk about deputization. Uh, before you can work with this data, before you can usher data in and out of the system, seriously, you need to attend an accreditation session. And thanks to Charles Birchall for tailoring one for us. Uh, that kind of suited us and that we all went through as we started this work. So uh, you need to have that. And then the behind the bars part of this is uh, even once you can work with this, the situation is now you're inside working with this data. A, there's no outside. There's no access to the external internet. And that that's important because, you know, if you want to look at uh, how do how do machine learning programmers really spend their day? What do they do at, at work? Uh, increasingly, the way things go is they work with one hand on Google and one hand on their code. You don't move a step. You want to do something? Just Google. It's one of the beautiful things about Python is that it's all out there and somebody's done and said, oh, there's a piece I need. I'll just grab that and put it in here. Let me just install that package that I didn't know about that's perfect for what I need. Well, you need classically the internet to do that. So that's a challenge for us is how close can we come to a productive programming experience in a situation where you're not sitting right with the machine and when you don't have access to the internet. So that was kind of one of our challenges. Um, and you know that's about you can't get out once you're on the inside, but how do you get in past those bars? Well, there's gatekeepers and that would be Rod McRae and, and his crew. You know, it's a tightly controlled barrier. There's a VPN, there's two factor authentication on it. And, and you'll see this, I'm gonna do a live demo of all this stuff. Um, once you're in, all you can do over that VPN is secure screen sharing. You can't move data in and out. Again, this might be motherhood for all you folks might know all this already, but I'm gonna mention it as context because it informs and drives the way we do things. So you get in through that gatekeeper, it gets you to what's known in the industry as a jump box. That's a, a Windows VM, an intermediary Windows VM inside MCHP. And uh, in a couple of seconds, I'll just jump ahead here. In a couple of seconds, there's gonna be a diagram that looks like that. <laughs> and we're gonna go through that carefully because there's a lot of gnarly systems aspects to it, but that's showing at the top here, your Windows machine, the jump box you get to from the VPN, screen sharing back and forth. And then the final, the last mile as it were, is getting from the MCHP jump box down to our Linux system, which is the deep learning machine. So sorry for jumping around the slides a little bit. I don't know how Zoom handles that or the recording, but uh, so we do something called SSH tunneling. 
over a private subnet. So, so Rod and Darren have a private subnet for us. We do SSH tunneling over that. That's widely recognized to be the most secure way you can do this kind of stuff. Reducing attack surfaces, I can talk all about that later. Uh, again, there'll be a deeper technical discussion coming along. Uh, getting back to the notion of occasional visitation, we're not moving data in and out over that VPN. Uh, there is a way to get small pieces of data in and out with email, but if you're going to move a big software repository uh, or a big data set, uh, you make an appointment and then you run into the machine room, the secure machine room, carrying a hard drive. That's affectionately referred to as sneaker net. And even if we could move data uh, in and out electronically, uh, one of the guys I used to work with in IBM used to say, never underestimate the bandwidth of an SUV loaded with mag tapes driving from New York City to Poughkeepsie. <laughs> so so I, it may well be you're farther ahead by carrying hard drives and trying to move it over a network anyway. Okay, so that's kind of pass one over things um, is, is the, the setup that we've got, what's driving what we're doing and how we're organized a little bit. I'm gonna now kind of set the stage a little bit. And this is the stuff I was talking about before we, we started a few seconds ago. Uh, and then use that to actually dive in on the, on the technical side of things. So uh, we are here, you are here. Um, this is the, the, the uh, headline from the uh, first paper, first major paper we published off the, the uh, deep learning work that we were doing. It was like, yep, we can train a neural network to recognize mild vertebral fractures and by golly, that is gonna predict uh, a major osteoporotic event. So that we were happy to get a good publication in a high impact journal courtesy of all the great data we had. Um, so you, we are here, you don't wanna be here. And again, I, I picked ones that are actually from Canada, but it's happening all over the world and it's ramping up, it's accelerating. Um, just to go a little further, here's, I, I mentioned for Lisa's benefit, eHealth in Saskatchewan. Oh, our data was going to some IP address in Europe for two months. We don't even know who's out there. And, and that happens. I will say just briefly, if you talk to the banks, I was saying the banks are ahead of everyone on cybersecurity. The, the CISO, CISO, it's like a CIO, but for security, they will tell you perimeter security is dead, not a thing. They know there will always be things breaking into their system and running around. They've got a whole sock security operations center that chases these things down, finds them as quick as they can, stamps them out. But what they live in fear of is those things exfiltrating data, sending data out of their bank sphere to bad guys who knows where. And that's, that's the, the, uh, the big problem. They're not worried about encryption and stuff like that. They got that worked out. So uh, we can talk later about why. There's a big uptick right now. It might have to do with Microsoft. It might have to do with uh, legal proceedings. These guys are going to make hay while the sun is still shining. TrickBot, Reuk, Conti, there's a whole lineage there. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to throw in, uh, just for the Windows bigots <laughs> slash Linux zealots, uh, guilty as charged, I'm one of them. Lest you think because you work in Linux that you're immune from this stuff, yeah, not so fast. Don't be so smug and don't be so complacent. Um, in an unusual move, the NSA and the FBI together made a joint announcement. This was a month or two months back. They, and they, they wanted the world to know quickly about Drovo Rub. Apparently, that's Russian that basically stands for wood chipper. <laughs> oh, good. This is what they intend to do to you, your system, and your data. And uh, it's a it's a rootkit. It's a Linux system extension rootkit. I'll we'll talk later or some other time about what that really means. But the reason they needed to get out there in a hurry is that most government uh, and defense servers, and financial industry servers, they all run Linux because it's supposed to be more secure. Well, it is a lot more secure than Windows. Anyone can break into a Windows system. Linux system, you need to be a little sharper and work a little harder. But the fact of the matter is even Linux systems are, can be at risk. And that's why they went out with this stuff right away. So some people might say, yeah, yeah, security. You know, my wife was like, the people in Winnipeg really have to worry about this. I was like, are you kidding? That's when I dug up the Saskatchewan one. And uh, somebody I know in Winnipeg who does cybersecurity has gotten calls from important places that everybody would recognize. And the, nature, and the extent of the call was, uh, oh, what do we do now? You know, and, and the answer that isn't helpful is you should have been more careful. Uh, and then they have to take care of themselves. 
One finer point before we dive in here, you can distinguish two general classes of things that can go wrong or happen to you. The reason for distinguishing is that in setting up your systems, you guard against these two different things differently and you mitigate them differently. So uh, more and more, I think people are hearing in the press about, you know, uh, 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 malware gets into your system, encrypts the whole damn thing, and then sends you a ransom note saying, you want your data back? You said you pay us, we'll give you the key. Uh, but there's no guarantee they didn't send half the data to themselves first and sell it on the dark web. Either way, have a set of offsite backups to, to protect yourself from that kind of thing. I already mentioned the second thing, exfiltration for a research institution, seems to me that's a bigger deal. You lose some of the data out of that, that MCHP repository, that's gonna be a very bad thing. So in the U people have insurance for that. And in the US, you can end up on the wrong end of a nasty lawsuit. You better have some lawyers. Okay, so um, this is the problem du jour. This is the challenge. Uh, for, the, for us embedding this workstation at MCHP. Um, I wrote security in red because it stops things from happening. And I wrote productivity in green because it helps you move towards your goals. And there's a, a natural inherent tension between those two things as opposing forces. You want to be safe, lock it all up in a safe, but then you can't do anything with it. So you've got to find a middle ground. And I'm representing that here and I'll get more real in a second, but yeah, here's an isolation chamber glove box with a Rubik's cube inside it and a set of heavy gloves. How fast do you think you can do the Rubik's cube that way? And you don't want to hamstring your machine learning developers. So if I say to someone, hey, you want to work with us? We have a great machine learning system. The only way you can work with it is by like command line shell stuff. They're going to go find another job. And so uh, it's how do we find the sweet spot in the middle there? Um, so uh, any questions so far? Okay, uh, getting a little deeper now, um, there's a guy named Bruce Schneier. I don't know if this is all well known to everybody in the call today or not, I'll mention it. He's a leading light on security and cybersecurity and has been for a long time. He wrote an article I loved. Anybody who writes an article that starts with, since I started working with Edward Snowden's papers, I mean, you have to read the rest of that article. Many things he says, one of them is, get yourself an air-gapped machine. air gap is there is no electronic connection between your machine and the outside world. Maybe a power cord and that's it. You want to move data, put it on a USB stick or a drive and walk it over. Better yet, burn it onto a CD. Um, so he himself admits, you know, you can't necessarily always do that. Uh, uh, and we have productivity issues. We can't do a pure air gap. Uh, brief pause and a message from your sponsor, brace yourself. This is where it's gonna get deep and technical in a hurry. I'm gonna do my best to lay signposts everywhere so you can see where we are as I walk through the demos, but uh, ask questions if it, if it uh, starts getting a little out of hand. So I'm calling this a hybrid or quasi air gap approach. And I already said in the previous slides, uh, we have electronic access in the form of MCHP's VPN and secure screen sharing, but we don't move data that way. And so uh, this is diagrammatic of, and I'm going to actually do this live in a second, you'll see it, is you start from your own Windows system. Um, again, maybe this is motherhood for everyone. It better be up to date on Windows updates and antivirus, because when you sign on, there's a special check that happens by the F5 endpoint inspector. And it looks at your system first and says, yep, you're clean. Uh, that machine is supposed to be in an access control room and originally was supposed to be in Manitoba. I think Charles and everyone was working on that. Maybe that's broader within Canada now. Um, either way, once you're okay, and this outside box is your Windows system, you can connect into a Windows VM that's inside MCHP. RAS is for remote access services. The screen sharing protocol is VMware's Horizon Blast. We won't go into any detail. Suffice it to say, these are top-notch organizations. This stuff is very carefully policed. It's the best hope we've got of doing something secure and not locking something in a safe where nobody can get to it. The Windows jump box, um, there's a process called vetting. You can email small data in and out of the system uh, by a process where MCHP people look at it first and make sure it's okay coming and going. Either way, from that Windows jump box, we then go down one more level using what's called SSH and SSH tunneling into our Linux workstation where we do all the machine learning. Here's our GPUs hanging off the bottom. Here's some drives I'll talk about more in a sec. 
we mirrored all of the conda repositories so that if somebody wants to install a package in their python environment that they would normally just grab off the internet but there's no internet we've got it all on a hard drive that we scanned and brought in and hook up to that machine inside mchp so that's where we're getting all our packages and our big data once you're inside that linux workstation you can run code like you could say uh, python run the hello.py program and it might print out hello world because we have uh, screen sharing in place between our Linux system and the Windows intermediary VM, it shows up on the desktop of that intermediary Windows VM. We do that over an open SSH and then MCHP's Horizon screen sharing takes it back to us in our Windows system wherever we are. So it's layer one down into layer two, down into layer three, and then back up again to layer two. That's kind of the drill that we're doing. We need Jupyter Notebooks. That's how kind of real Python developers move quickly. We need VNC because that's how people get a, a graphic desktop, even when they're not sitting right beside the machine. Million details in the slides in case somebody gets the slides afterwards. One disclaimer I need to do. I was gonna do some cyber security work for someone uh, and my wife said, don't be stupid. <laughs> Because you're going you're gonna to do this work for them and, and tell them you've checked their system and today it's buttoned up tight and can't be broken into. Tomorrow, some warped evil genius will find a new way to break in. They'll get in. The client's going to come to you and say, oh, come on. So let me just say here, nothing is foolproof. One more thing from Bruce Schneier. He says, if the NSA wants into your computer, it's in, period. There's no question. Um, and I, again, I don't know how much people pay attention to this stuff. I ran in 2013 was busy running nuclear fuel enrichment, contrary to agreements with the world. Um, I guess the NSA, maybe working with the Mossad, managed to cross their air gap with a virus that over revved uh, all their centrifuges, basically blew up their whole site there that was supposed to be enriching uranium. So it's a matter of how good and creative the bad guys are and how badly they want in. And by combinations of cyber means or physical means or a combination thereof, they can get stuff out. So what we're trying to do is risk management. And I will say it's fun reading. You know, these guys are warp geniuses that they decided that they can get something into your system, never mind over revving your centrifuges because we don't have any, but they can ramp your power consumption up and down just by turning the GPUs off and on. Those GPUs take hundreds of watts. They can sit just outside your data center and watch your power demands go up and down. They have sensitive enough stuff. So if the NSA wants to know what Bill's doing on that workstation, they can exfiltrate as much as they want. It's lower bandwidth, but it works. Okay, it's about risk management. We're gonna lower the probability of an incident happening. We're crying not to hamper productivity too badly. Um, any questions before we, uh, what does they say in Bugs Bunny on with the show? This is it. We'll go to cartoons from here. Um, any questions about that so far? Okay, so um, I thought the best way to do this would be just a day in the life. Here's what a programmer does step by step working with this system. So there's a set of things here. Um, I've decided not to do it live because there's all places where the system has to think for 10 seconds and that takes a while. So better to run videos because I can replay those at like double speed and we'll get through it more quickly. But A is how do you connect to your system? Uh, that's MCHP's world, the connection in the front door, but it informs how we have to think about things as we do the work. Then using a command line on the system, then running Jupyter Notebook, get a virtual desktop, and finally, how we do Python environments. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I put the copy of this architecture diagram here because we're going to go through that a couple of times. So let's just switch over. Um, this is actually, just to show you, there's nothing up my sleeve in a sense. This is live. I've already logged into the system. I guess if I do date, does that prove that it's actually running live? This is this is Doug's directory uh, on the MCHP. So if I change to where we keep a lot of our data, um, there's my directory on the giant data store. I keep a, a repeatable run copy of the, the vertebral fracture work we did. So I can always run it just to make sure everything still works OK. Um, so inside there, there's scripts and data. Um, if we look inside the data, 
there's, you know, there's, it's when you get in there with this stuff, you know, there's 89 copies of your data all set up differently because you're not sure what's going to work. So dual energy shuffled is where we did a lot of our work. Here's the test side of that, as opposed to the training or, or uh, validation side of that. Uh, let me get rid of my window here. It shows people, there we go. Um, and then split, split into two classes, uh, fractured versus normal. And there's a, a, a lot of images in there. So I'll just look at the first five. Uh, if I do that, same thing and I'll do it with a minus L on it. Um, I'll talk later about how we protect this stuff, but these files in this case are owned by Doug. They're also owned by a group of users called BDMFP, Bone Density Measure for Fracture Prediction. And the permission rights on these files say Doug can read and write them. People in the group can read them. The rest of the people can't even tell they're there. So anyway, that's just me saying this stuff is live and running this morning and later on I'm happy to hang around and play with this stuff all day if people have specific things they're interested in but um, let me switch uh, to a video so here's how you get into this machine you start up chrome you go to ras.mchp.ca point that out over there that gets us to the front door of mchp um, you give a name that you get from Rod. You give a passcode that's part what you made up and part what's on the, uh, the key fob, the RSA Secure ID key fob. It generates new numbers every minute or second or whatever. And you put those in there and, and that's what gets you in the front door. F5 endpoint inspector is now checking to make sure my Windows machine is in fact all up to date and secure. There's no, the, the virus software is good and trusting that the virus software has made sure there's no malware on my machine. Uh, a little faster. Okay, so it went in, it cleared the machine. I'm now into MCHP land. And now it's asking me if I'd like to go to RAS radio. That is the radiology remote access services uh, set of Windows VMs, the intermediary jump boxes. I say yes. Takes me in there. Okay, I'll stop here for a sec. We are now thinking back to that diagram at the second level. This is a Windows machine, virtual machine, inside MCHP. It was set up for us by Rod and company. Um, it has, I won't show you some file systems and stuff on it. It also has Google Chrome on it that we can use as a way to look at what's going on inside our Linux system. It has PuTTY on it, which is a way for us to SSH connect into that system in the first place. And it also has, oops, I'm not running live, so I can't click down there, uh, a VNC viewer. So from here, the next step to get the third layer is we open uh, PuTTY, which is an SSH thing. And, and now we click on a profile and that opens a window on the Linux system. So here's me logging in on that Linux system. Showing you my home directory. And that's the end of that video. So let me... Go back for a sec. We went from here. We jumped down to here. We're now inside here just typing textual commands. Is that good? Any questions about that? Okay. So now, uh, let's see if I do this. There we go. So back to where we were. And I did this a few seconds ago live, you saw. So I'm going to change down to where we've got... Uh, where I have some scripts and some data from some of the runs we did for the uh, vertebral fracture, training the neural net and then actually running it. So uh, again, if you try to sell a Python programmer these days on doing command line stuff, they'll go find a different job. Um, it's millennials, you know, uh, they've done a study and when they do exit interviews, the HR people from big corporations as people quit, one of the biggest complaints from millennials is IT systems that just get in their way and don't let them do quickly the things they want to do. So really behooves us to try and get this experience as streamlined as possible for them. So what I'm going to do here is run something called Jupyter Notebook. Uh, just for people who might not be familiar, Python programmers love this, as do others, R and everything. Uh, it's a way you can just type little fragments of code and run them right away and see their little result pieces at a time, not having to write a whole program and run the whole program and, and work in a more cumbersome way. Now, normally when you're sitting at a workstation, you just type Jupyter Notebook and the thing pops open in front of you. If I type Jupyter Notebook here, a window is gonna open on the display 
on this machine inside the MCHP machine room. And it's dark in there and nobody's looking at it. So that's not very helpful. Uh, so what we say is run the Jupyter notebook here on the third level on Bill's machine, but don't open, it's done with a browser window. Don't open the window on that machine. Instead, go listen on port, in this case, 8905. So this is saying our Linux deep learning machine is gonna sit there and act as a server waiting for somebody to come to it and say, show me that notebook. So let me keep going here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I couldn't hear that. Somebody asked one question? Nope. Okay, um, at any rate, so you'll see what happens here. Let me just get this out of the way. When it starts up, um, it burps out a URL. It says anybody who wants to see the notebook on this machine has to enter that URL. So if you watch here, I'm gonna highlight that URL. Okay, now I've grabbed it. So I started a notebook on that Linux system, Deep inside MCHP, I grab this URL, which is the one you would use to connect to that notebook. Now what I'm going to do, and you'll see that my mouse is over on this side again. Now I'm at the second level working with that Windows machine. I'm going to open Google. I'm going to paste in that URL that we just got. And when I hit enter, boom, this is a Jupyter notebook. I'll select scripts. I'll pick a particular script. There it is. Okay, so just for a second to switch back to the slides. We were here on our host Windows machine. We went to the MCHP Windows machine. We dropped into our Linux machine. We said, start a notebook. And that notebook is now displaying back on a browser inside the Windows, the, uh, Windows machine at MCHP. And we see that by the screen sharing. Um, everyone okay with that? So I'll, I'll let this run a little bit. It's a standard notebook. And so um, the cells in the notebook, sometimes they're documentation, sometimes they're code. Doug? Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you're, on, you're, using, you're cruising the internet now using a browser. Can you just download anything? Any, what's stopping you pull something off the internet using Chrome and putting it in there? That Chrome can't reach the internet. So let's try that. Uh, here's the box. Okay, again, this is the Linux system. Here is the Chrome on the Windows machine. This better work or Rod gets fired, I think. Um, let me just say, uh, I'll go to Yahoo. See down here, it says connecting. You could wait a long time. That's never going to come back. Okay, so that that answers my question. That's a, that that Chrome is has limited capacity to go to certain places. Right. the 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 uh, better the better way to put that would be uh, inside here. The the machine. It's not Chrome. The whole machine has no network connection to the outside world, and in fact. This Windows machine that we're talking about where I was running that Chrome, the only thing it can, there's a few small exceptions here I could treat another time, but the only thing this thing can talk to, and by the way, there's one of these for each of our users. So if I'm logged in and Barrett's logged in and Bill's logged in, there's three of these things. There's a little tiny virtual pri private virtual network set up by Rod and Company that has on it only three machines, my VM, Bill's VM and Barrett's VM and the Linux deep learning system. That's the only network stuff that can happen is those three machines talking to each other. They can't talk to anything else, can't talk to other machines inside MCHP, for sure can't talk to the internet. Okay, so I just ran one of the cells in our notebook. I did an import, says, yeah, using the TensorFlow backend. So that's what we did in this initial work. You know, there's PyTorch and everything else you can talk about, but, but TensorFlow and Keras is what we did. You can see from all the imports. So yeah, using that backend, we'll just go a little further and then I'll, I'll move uh, in a different direction. Um, I set up some data, uh, create a model. Um, now, 
when I actually create this model, you can look and see that as soon as I say, yep, create this neural network, back on the Linux machine, if you look at the standard output, you can say, oh yeah, it found our two GPUs. It can see how much memory is on them. It's busy allocating it all up. Um, and if you watch down here, this little star means we're still executing in that cell. It's still building up our neural network and that'll go a little bit longer. There, it's finished when it gets that number. Now I can run this, it says, well, give me a summary of that. And so this breaks down now the neural network it created, all the layers, you know, so input layers, convolutional layers, batch normalization, it all goes on. So that kind of lists them out. Um, you can, the next cell down you can see is to do a model summary. So it kind of will say, yeah, you've got about 5 million parameters in that neural net. Then I can go ahead and do a, uh, I guess I'll go just a little bit longer here. We can set up data generators that will do, uh, it's called data augmentation. Take all the images we've got, now make copies of things that are slightly rotated and out of shape to keep your neural net from kind of zooming in too much on exactly the data you've got, but be more general for all kinds of data you might get. Okay, so um, I think that's as far as I'm gonna go with that one. Any questions about that? Um, so that's, that's uh, using Jupyter Notebook coming back to that machine and us doing our work. And you know, as far as machine learning developers go, this in itself is enough to keep them pretty happy. So you know, what do we got next here? Uh, let me close that. Uh, sorry, close that video. Good. Um, the next thing that happens, anybody who's kind of a veteran machine learning or data science developer knows is you run all your stuff. You get some results, you look at them and you say, uh, are you kidding? That can't be right. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, poor old Bill uh, is now sitting and reviewing things that this machine learning system came up with trying to understand how, why did it think that and how did it think that and could that possibly be right? So uh, here goes. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is to say, okay, now I'd like to look at those images. Well, again, if all you've got is running commands in a textual window on that Linux workstation, uh, you can't look at an image that way. What are you gonna do with it? And so there's a whole notion of something called VNCs, a virtual network computer will let us get a graphical desktop of the kind that we would normally run if we were sitting at that workstation remote out on our Windows machine. Okay, and so I'll just go through this uh, quickly, is there scripts that we give every user that start up something called the type VNC server? Um, and I can talk in a second about why we chose type VNC and XFCE instead of Unity and Vino. There's a lot of design choices that have to go and, and someone, maybe me, gets his fingers burned a couple of times trying all these different alternatives till you find the one that really works right. What's going on now, just like when we started that Jupyter Notebook and it said, okay, I'm running, and I'm listening, waiting to hear from someone uh, on the other side uh, uh, that wants to see this. Um, same thing happens when we run VNC. Uh, again, uh, it says, okay, we started up, uh, but we're not opening the desktop on the display in the machine room. We're gonna serve it over the internet securely. And it's at colon one, that's the important part there. Now I move from the Linux system over to the Windows system. This gets to be second nature. It might be a little bit hard keeping the layers uh, uh, separate now, but when you work with it, I think it goes pretty good. Uh, now on the Windows machine, I'm running something called Ultra VNC and skin rod set this up for us and a viewer. And that thing will connect to anywhere that's serving out a desktop. So we let that go. We give the number we got when we started, it was colon one. And I can do this, Barrett can be doing this, Siobhan can be doing this, everyone can be doing it at the same time. One of the, the benefits of the way we chose to do this was that you can have multiple of these things going on. It's lightweight enough, it doesn't bog the system down and there's a separate desktop for every session. So if we run that, gotta give a password, although that's not really where the security comes from in this case. Now, uh, I'm gonna stop there and say, now what's going on? We're working on the Windows machine inside a client that shows us the desktop from some other machine, in this case, the Linux system, and we can type commands on it. Um, hopefully not to belabor things too much. I wanna go back for one sec to the slides again. Again, uh, we're 
deep inside here, running things on the Linux system with a display on the Windows jump box. Here's another way to look at it. I don't know if this helps people. It's one screen, but really that's nesting. I'm running, seriously, a MacBook Pro. My Windows machine that I run here in my house to connect to MCHP in a locked room uh, is a Windows VM that I do with VirtualBox, actually. The windows on that MCHP Windows machine I've got, here's the Jupyter Notebook we were doing before. So this is all the blue stuff is the Windows machine. And then in green is stuff happening on the Linux system. So you can look at it as you know three layers and you're going back and forth, or you can see it almost as nesting. I don't know, people got, ever seen those Russian dolls? It looks, looks like one doll when you get it. Uh, but if you keep opening it up, there's like a smaller and smaller doll inside of it, it's almost fractal, I guess, in a way. Uh, and so that to me, this is kind of another way of thinking about all this. Um, there won't be time today. I'm happy to discuss with people later what's really going on. A few seconds ago, I said security isn't really coming from um, the password I gave for BNC there. What's really going on, this is the Linux system. These are those Windows VMs. I've got Doug's, Scott's, Barrett's, separate Windows VMs that I talked about a while ago. They're all on one network together. Everything I put on a diagram is there for a reason. I will say that normally when you do a Jupyter Notebook remote, it's on port 8888. And I don't know how much people into TCP IP. Every machine has an address like a street address. Every machine has a bunch of ports on it. Those are like doors in the house. So you can walk up to the house, any house, and, and, and houses here, they all have different doors. <clears throat> you knock on door one, who answers that? Somebody that will, that will show you a Jupyter Notebook. You knock on door two, oh, there's somebody there that will show you a VNC desktop. You, you knock on door three is somebody that will transfer files back and forth with you. So those are all different services on different ports. And if you're a bad guy, each one of those doors, they speak a different language and protocol, and, and, you can, and they're, they're subject to being fooled differently. So in fact, when we say we're talking over port 8888 from a Windows VM to be able to see a notebook that's being served off that Linux system, yeah, really, it's not going over port 8888. Really, and that's what all these double yellow lines are, it, the systems don't know. The Windows machine doesn't know. The Linux system doesn't know. The software on this machine don't know. In fact, everything is going through one door, and that's port 22. So all these connections are really out of port 22. That is SSH. That's about as secure as you can get in the world. We only have one door to our house that even looks like it's there. Nobody can even see the other doors. The only door you can come to is the SSH door. That's port 22. And uh, it's, as, it's as secure as, as you can be in the world. It's what everyone uses. It's carefully reviewed all the time. Okay. Questions about that? Here we go. So here's me now wanting to run graphic tools. I can't do it if I connect directly to the workstation because it's just textual. So now I started VNC. Here's a whole desktop that in fact is running on that Windows machine. There's a client on the Windows machine and I can see on my Windows machine at home, but the desktop is actually doing its work on the Linux system. So here we go. You know, Bill said, geez, I can't believe that that image has a fracture in it. I want a closer look. So on Linux systems, there's a tool called GIMP which is a, it's an image manipulation program. It's basically a Swiss army knife for doing image manipulation. And again, you can't run that in a textual window. So we do it with this virtual desktop. You're gonna see, let me I'll speed that up a little bit. Here's me going to that same place we were at before. There's some image files. We'll start GIMP. There it is. I'm going through this a little quickly now. I'm gonna open one of those image files. There it is, you know. Uh, uh, I really loved that the first time I really met with Bill about this stuff a couple of years ago now, he's like, okay, can you see where the uh, fracture is in there? <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? And so he explained to me, you know, what happens when you fracture a vertebra and, you know, kind of caves in a little bit along the sides. It's a little ragged on the edges. And I said, oh, it's like when I finished drinking a beer and I squashed the can with my hands. He's like, exactly. That's what it looks like. Either way, sometimes it's hard to tell. And so maybe contrast enhancement would help. So this is what you do with GIMP. You couldn't do this 
just VPNing into a Linux workstation if you didn't have this virtual desktop. So here's me fooling with all kinds of controls to try and do contrast enhancement to get a better look. Uh, any real radiologist just would look at this and say he has no clue what he's doing, and that would be true. <laughs> so at any rate, all I wanted to show was, yes, you can get a desktop uh, that you can see at home, and it's just as if you were sitting on the machine running real graphical tools. Um, any questions about that? Hi, Doc. This is Chen. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so if you have the virtual desktop, why don't you just open the uh, Jupyter notebook on the That's virtual a screen? Great question. And it shows you're not having any trouble seeing all those layers and nesting I'm painting because the answer is you absolutely could. Period. And I've done it. Sometimes I've done it that way. The, the real, maybe one finer point on that answer it's a little bit slower. You'll notice delays a little bit more doing it that way. Um, one of the things I was gonna say actually, let me just quickly get back to the slides and I'm blasting ahead to the end here. Design choices, you know, why are we only going to this machine through SSH? That's to reduce our attack surface. Why are we using XFCE and type BNC server to do that remote desktop? I already said multiple sessions, distinct one per. It's also much lighter weight and much more performant over a VPN with screen sharing than the standard installation on a Linux machine. That Linux machine as it was ran something called Unity as a desktop and Vino as the VNC layer. It was so slow, it was painful. Uh, even with what we've got here, it's still a little bit of a lag compared to what you get when you just run the Chrome browser. So. Bit of a longer answer to a short question, but yes, that's a great question. It's exactly uh, the point. Okay. Now, Rob Belcher here, just uh, how, uh, I'm, I'm probably pushing the analogy too far, but to have only a single door open, does it ever get crowded? Like, is, is there, are there times oh. when that, that one port just gets overloaded? The real TCP IP details we can talk more later is, that, that port 22 is just where it listens for initial connections. As soon as you make a connection, the system shunts you off onto numbers, you know, 28,000 or something. So that's just the place where it hooks up. You know what? If we were trying to serve uh, 2,000 or 25,000 users, we'd have this set up differently. But for 10 users or 12 users, no, not an issue. Good. Thanks. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, where are we here? Yeah, there we go. So Conda. Um, okay, so the last thing I'm going to show quickly, because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, there we go. Um, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. One of the things I said at the outset is, and it's 100% true, um, Python programmers do things like, uh, I think I, here, oh, there's something called Markdown. Just, this is just a, a random, simple hello world example. Markdown is a way to write text and you put stars around things to say that's important and stuff. Uh, but maybe you want to show that text on a web page, so you need to turn it into HTML. This actually happened to me, I don't know, a couple of years ago. So I just Google, how do I, Python, how do I turn Markdown text into HTML? Boom, there it is. Somebody's done it and, and uh, you use this Python package and it actually, you know, depending on where you look, Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, uh, medium.com is a lot of really good places. That's the trick, by the way, in using Google. I don't have to tell people from the medical community for sure that when you Google, you get a lot of stuff and you can't believe most of it. So you got to know where to go. But anyway, good source says, oh, yeah, there's a package called Markdown. Just do a pip install. So great. Yeah, and then you do an import. So uh, here we go. I went and wrote my code. This is just a hello world example. I want to take code that looks like this. That's kind of Markdown format. And I want to turn it into HTML. Okay, let that run. Okay, and now I'm gonna run it. No, I'm not gonna run it. <laughs> it failed miserably because I went to import Markdown. There was no package named Markdown. Um, when I took the recording, I did these, I think last night. The next thing I did is said, what, no Markdown package? So you can say to Pip, show me all the Python packages installed on this machine. And the answer is, uh, Python packages that have the word mark in them. We have this bookmarks thing and this bookmark things. We don't have a package called Markdown too. So what do we do about that? 
Um, getting short on minutes, so I'll just say quickly, for a number of good reasons, we're going to use Conda rather than PIP. I don't know how many people here are actually doing Python development, but maybe I'll just say quickly, uh, this was the design choices slides right at the back of the deck. Why are we using Conda instead of PIP? A, it handles non-Python pieces. A lot of Python stuff like matplotlib and whatnot, they depend on pieces underneath them that aren't written in Python. PIP can't help you. Conda can do the whole darn thing. Secondly, Conda can handle Python itself. So make yourself a little environment, a little isolated world inside our system. And in there, you can put any version of Python you want. Until recently, go try and have multiple versions of Python on one machine. It was not fun. Got better, but it was not fun. Um, DLL hell has been a Windows thing for a long time. With Conda, every environment you set up, a little space with just the Python packages you need to run just your code in there, it's completely isolated from everything else. When you use PIP, there's all this distance about scope, site, user, project, forget about it. The other thing about Conda that's nice is they have a curated set of Python packages, like 800 really good packages, kind of blessed by them for doing data science and machine learning. It's great to have that to rely on. Finally, if there's a package you need, like Siobhan's working and says, oh, I need the PyDICOM package. Yeah, it turns out that's not in anywhere we can get it in Conda. It turns out inside Conda, you actually can run PIP in a way that fits with the Conda world. So that's kind of design choices there. I'll just run through it now. You'll see this in action. This is what programmers really do. And by golly, it works on Bill's workstation because, not because there's internet, because there isn't, but because we copied all of the repositories off the internet, put them on a hard drive, it's called mirroring. And then we attach that hard drive inside this machine inside MCHP. So as a programmer, you don't even know that you don't have the internet. Those packages just work. So um, I'll take two minutes here and then I'll be done. You create an environment where you're going to do something. So I'm going to run the, I call it markdown environment, MD environment. So create an empty environment. Then I'll say, uh, okay, what's inside that environment? Um, first, you have to activate the environment. Say, so okay, go into that little Python world. This works for R also, by the way, for people to do R stuff. Now I'm inside that environment. Uh, first, I'm going to say, okay, show me all the environments on that machine. So there's the MD environment one, sorry, that I just made. Now I can say, what's inside my environment? So I do this list and like, there's nothing in there. All I did was create the environment. So now I'm going to search the repository and say, show me uh, markdown packages that I could install. And I'm really only interested in ones that are version 2.3.7 or later. Um, so it shows me there's a whole bunch of versions and each one of them needs a particular version of Python to work. And so I'm gonna replay this a little quicker actually. Let's get to the end. Um, here's me installing both a Python I want. I think I'll use version 3.7 Python. This was like magic when it first came out. I was like, man, this is going to make my life so much quicker and easier. Then I installed the package. So there's the markdown package and there's Python. These are all things inside my environment. And now, <clears throat> I wanted to show you, yep, now it's running the Python that's inside my environment, not the Python that was already on the machine. I run the thing and oh, by golly, it worked. Now it has converted that markdown text I showed you into HTML text. If I keep going, and I think I won't in the interests of time, the next thing I do is I set this, this is all work I'm doing in text on the machine. I can now take this Python environment with this version of Python and those particular packages, and I can make that be the kernel, it's called, uh, that gets used inside a notebook, and then I can do all my work inside a notebook more graphically off the workstation. So I'm going to say that's where I'm going to call it for today. Um, let's see. So the slides have a, a summary in them at the end of the things that we did. I'm going to kill the screen share. Uh, if I do that, yep, and that's it. So that's kind of the saga of how Bill's machine got inside MCHP and how it's actually been working, thank God, knock on wood, really good for us. Barrett and Siobhan blasting away, Bill's in there, multiple people. Oh, and one thing I didn't say, 
in a pandemic, we'd have been dead in the water if this machine was still sitting inside a lab at the St. Boniface Hospital. We've got remote access, you know, God bless MCHP and their staff for getting us this. And now we've been, we didn't miss a beat. In fact, we're probably doing more work than we would have if there wasn't a pandemic, so all that. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much and happy to take any more questions. Also happy to hang around all day and play with this if anybody wants to try it out. Thanks, Doug. I mean, that's that's great. And just to let you know, I mean, uh, this is, uh, is really, uh, Totally, uh, Doug's baby in terms of uh, getting us compliant with uh, with with uh, the new Manitoba Health uh, regulations in terms of consolidating data access through MCHP. So uh, this uh, we're the we're the we're the canary in the coal mine on this for Manitoba Health, and so you can see that uh, it works. I'm not going to say it's easy because uh, you can hey. see how how, comp how complicated it was. Hey, you're, you're indispensable. And also, and when you talk about data security, I'm going to say it's good you're on our side. Yeah. You know, Maxwell oh. Smart. Ma Maxwell Smart comes to mind. You, you're a force for goodness and niceness in the world. And I'm glad you're not down on the dark way. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it to others to, to ask questions. I'm going to put a finer point on what you said. Not easy to set this up. True. I hope it's pretty easy to use. I'll have to ask Barrett and Siobhan about that. Sorry, go ahead. Doug, you started off by saying, this is Alan again, you started off by saying that what you said might cause me some consternation at NCHP. On yeah. the contrary, I think you've demonstrated that you managed to do this in a secure way. So is there something you haven't said that you... <laughs> no, security? you know what? Only what I said to you before we started, Alan, which is never be complacent. It, you know, honest to God, your setup looks great to me. You know, it was great to work with and it looks secure in many ways. It doesn't mean that that Bill doesn't turn evil tomorrow and figure out for himself how to hack his way in here. So many different kinds of protection and always being vigilant. Thank you. I will say also, uh, I should have, Bill wanted to jump in and say, you know, we're, we're, we're absolutely being careful with this data. I didn't show the video where I show, it's kind of mundane, that all the protection, the way we, I said a little bit about protection bits and groups and group membership, but we have one group, Linux group on this machine per approved project that lists all the approvals out on it. And that's what controls ownership of the files and access permissions. Again, I could show somebody someday. Uh, nobody likes to see an auditor, but if one does show up, I'm very hopeful we'd be okay. <laughs> So another Can I ask question. A question? Very good. Oh, sorry. Oh no, thanks, Alan. It's Marshall Peets. I just wanted to uh, say thank you. It's very, uh, very interesting how that's set up. And I, I guess um, the question is, um, you say you said a number of times that it takes uh, vigilance. Um, and I guess the question is, who on the team is the the person responsible for that? Um, the the care and curation of the security. Is that a shared responsibility? Is that primarily you? On this system, it's me. There was actually a slide I didn't have time for that says, who are you trusting at each step of the way? So on that VPN and the 2FA and all that, we're trusting Rod and Charles and Alan ultimately. On the open SSH right. and all that side of stuff on the Linux machine, yeah, you're trusting me. Got it, okay, thank you. So my question, Doug, is um, you've, clearly put a ton of work into, into setting this up, making it work, et cetera. How much of what you've done is now transferable to others who may want to do something similar? Um, I would hope it's quite transferable. Uh, there was a lot of learning and trying and avenues to go down, you know, uh, uh, and backtracking. I mean, if you if you buy a Linux workstation tomorrow, Alan, and you want to put it inside MCHP. Now, let me just say, when we started, I said to Bill, ah, a month, you know, January 1st, I'll start. I'll be done February 1st. Um, I delivered June 30th. <laughs> wow. That's just stuff. I'm going to say to you, now that I've done all that and I keep copious notes, I do too many things in a day. So I have to keep notes about everything. Otherwise, I'm all confused and messed up. With all my notes and everything, if you buy a Linux machine tomorrow, you want to set up and do this? Should I say a month again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would take many weeks. Absolutely transferable. The beauty of Linux is all these things, they kind of are stable, they work the way they should, there's lots of help on the network. So yes, transferable. Uh, Doug, uh, how big a machine? Oh, like if someone big... were buying a, buying a machine to drop inside beside Bill's. What's, what's uh, your... 
I, one, one answer to the how big question probably would be, uh, you can get the GPUs for free out of NVIDIA <laughs> and the machine itself could be like only eight or $10,000. But you know, how many terabytes of storage for your data? You know, yeah. we got two GPUs with a couple hundred megabytes. If I, let's see here, let me do this quickly. I always like to have desktop one. Okay, so now let me get to the slides. One of the slides I skipped over was this one. And, and the, I have get the, um, Allison has the slides. They're kind of big. I did them with an E crayon. So I colored and it generated megabytes worth of stuff. But the, if you get the slides, there's the answer to your question. You mm -hmm. know, how many cores have we got? Um, how many gigahertz are we running at? 64 gigabytes of RAM. Um, it, and it, the, the machine now admittedly is a couple of years old. So, you know, absolutely. You could take another 10 or $12,000 and, and make another one right beside it. Yep. Thank you. Oh, see, there's chats in there. Now I see yep. there's chats. You can't see them. <laughs> yeah, can you see that there's a question from uh, Olawali? Yeah. Can you see, read that? Yes. Yeah, so our, um, everything that's there should work actually right now. I didn't have a chance, but the uh, as long as those mirror drives have the R channels in them from Anaconda, which I think they do, it should just work. Conda does R as well as it does Python. Selling you pack not the, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess what I guess what the, that question is getting to is there's other machines somewhere in MCHP, and one of them must be a server that has our packages, and somebody wants to install our packages off our machine. Well, that won't work because we're in a little private subnet. Nobody can get at our machines, and we can't get at theirs. But like you say, I'd be happy to work with Rod or or uh, Robert or whoever, and uh, set a little machine up in there that has this stuff on it that could act as a server for you guys. So, yeah. Oh, we do run R on our environment anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, right now the packages are manually installed by Charles or Rod. So I think what Ola Wally was getting at was, you know, if we have a mirror server, um, you know, that all the packages are there and users could install yeah. um, the ones they want themselves. Yeah. I see. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, guys like me, I just, I live, I love this stuff. What can I say? Some people retire and work on a car in their garage. I retire and work on this. What we could do is take our mirror drives, put them on a server higher up sort of inside MCHP where all your machines could get at it. And then Rod would just have to define a network link from our machine up to that server machine. And then we could reach the repositories there as well. So we can have a repository machine somewhere and then our machines would have themselves to talk to plus that one extra machine. There's also one extra link I didn't show on our desktop. Rod's got a link where we can go look at the data dictionary for the repository. Can't get the data, but can look at it all there. So Bill can think about, hmm, which of these things do I really want to ask for? So that's obviously another little link that's already been put in place. Yeah, and that's the side benefit to being inside of MCHP for, for our work is that if we want to uh, uh, do an additional data extract to, to link with what we've got, uh, uh, it can all be done now within MCHP. So the, uh, the, the approval process and the data security and the transfers are a lot, in theory, a lot, uh, a lot slicker than uh, uh, requesting an external uh, uh, data extract. You're welcome. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thank Thanks for all for joining us, and uh, you know we'll reconvene uh, four weeks hence. We have uh, have a another another talk lined up for you. So. Bye, everybody.